So the idea here, and I'm just going to do a couple from this worksheet. You don't have this one, but we're going to convert from feet to miles. And the conversion that you have to find is one that relates feet into miles. And, you know, it's, they're, they're not that organized here, but, you know, here's one right there that 5,280 feet is, is equal to one mile. It's got both of the units that we're interested in for this problem, feet and miles. And so 5,280 feet equals one mile. Now, because these two are equal, we can write them as a fraction, one over the other. This is equal to one because the, the quantity on the top is equal to the quantity on the bottom. It's like saying five over five or, or 10 over 10. But since these two lengths are the same, when you divide them like this, you get one. You can also flip them. If you had one mile over 5,280 feet, again, the quantity on the top is equal to the quantity on the bottom. So what we do, the whole unit analysis, dimensional analysis problem involves seeing what the problem is, finding a ratio, that uses both of those, here are two, and then select the one that will cancel out the unit that you're not interested in. So if we take 35,640 feet, and notice that feet, if we just put it over one, feet is the unit in the top here. So if I wanna convert feet to miles, I have to cancel out the feet unit and leave the miles unit standing. So when I'm trying to select between these two, I want to select the one that has feet down here so that I can cancel the feet. All right, and the one that, that would work here is this one. We put 5,280 feet over one mile, the feet cancel. And then the rest of this is a calculator problem where we're going to take the two numbers on the top, multiply them together, and we'll get this number. And then we're going to divide by the product of those two numbers. And we get 6.75. And the only unit that remains is miles. So how many miles is 35,640 feet? Well, turns out to be 6.75 miles. And this is a unit analysis. This is kind of a one-step unit analysis problem. Now, I want to do another one, like um, number, number part C here, because these are the ones that cause students the most difficulty. And I've given you a couple of these on the worksheet that you're about to do. The other thing is that this involves the metric measurements. So as soon as you have the metrics measurements, if you're going to memorize something, it would be this, this little grid here. It tells you the relationship between the different metric units. So meters is in the middle. These are all units of, of area. And then millimeters is way to the right. And then you have centimeters decimeters, meters, decameters, DAM, and then hectometers and finally kilometers. So if we're going from millimeters to centimeters, millimeters to centimeters, that means we're going one place to the to the right. So in a in a in a length problem, if we were doing this, 47 millimeters is equal how many centimeters, we would just take this decimal point and move it one place to the right and get 4.7 centimeters is equal to 47 millimeters. Now, when we're dealing with area, right, we have to think about it in a different way. So if you have 47 millimeters, square millimeters, we're going to write this as 47 millimeters times millimeters. I know it looks strange. But we need to cancel out both of those millimeters. We know that 10 millimeters, because there's just one movement here, one spot, 10 millimeters is equal to one centimeter. But if I just multiply, divide by 10 one time, it's only going to cancel out one of those millimeter units. So what I have to do instead is multiply that same unit fraction again. And then we would cancel out both of those millimeters. And so instead of moving just one place to the right, since we're dividing by 100, you have to move the decimal point two places to the right. So 47 is the number that remains on the top. And if you multiply those two tens, you get 100 on the bottom. 
both of the millimeters cancel, but you have two centimeters left over. So we would then write this as 0 0.47, 47 over 100, and then you have square centimeters. So you cannot convert square units, areas, in the same way that you would convert length because areas are in two dimensions. Many students just err by just moving the decimal point one place and write reporting the answer as 4.7. All right, so you can see you can't do that here. Now let me go up one more problem. All right, so this is 0.47 is the answer to this one, square centimeters. Now let's go up to a volume problem. Now volume problem is um, length times width times height, or if you want to think of rectangular measures, it's the number of cubes that would fill a room, number of small little cubes, one by one by one unit cubes. So if you want to draw a cube, um, well, let's see, let's see if I can draw one here. All right, it's not perfect. But if you consider just like one of these cubes, this little one up here in the top, yeah. see if I can, I don't know if you can see that little red, red cube up there. How many little red cubes would it take to fill out this entire box? We're going to call that little red one, one um, unit cube or one cubic unit. If the unit was centimeters, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, it'd be one cubic centimeter. Okay. You can just actually count if you want. But there are three coming this way, two coming this way, and four coming this way. So if you just multiply those three numbers together, you get 24. It would take 24, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then you got 12 on the back side. 24 cubic centimeters. All right, so that's kind of the idea of volume there, but we're going to be doing some conversion. So let's take a look at um, this problem right here. It says 3.7 cubic kilometers is equal to how many cubic meters? Now we can see up here that the smaller unit is meters. So it's going to take more of the smaller unit to equal one of the bigger units. And if we go from meters to kilometers, you can see that there's 10, 100, 1,000. 1,000 meters in one kilometer, 1,000 meters. So we're going to use this 1,000 meters equals one kilometer. But in this case, we have 3.7, and that's cubic kilometers. So if we want to expand that unit, it would be kilometers times kilometers times kilometers, three cubic kilometers would be a big box. And then if we want to convert to cubic meters, we have to have three copies of the meter unit there. And we have to get rid of the three instances of the kilometer unit. So not only do we need to multiply by one, not only do we have to multiply by two as we would in the area example, the previous one, but in this case, we have to multiply by three of these. Each one of these fractions is equal to one because the, the, the length on the top is equal to the length on the bottom. So multiplying this original uh, unit, this, the original volume by one by one by one preserves the original volume. But this allows us to cancel out Kilometer for kilometer, cancel out the three kilometers. And then what's left is meters, meters, meters. So what's left is the cubic meter. Let's see, thousands, hundred thousands. No, this would be millions and this would be another three. So this would be billions. So 3.7 billion. I'm not sure if you type this on the calculator, if your calculator would give you this or not. It's an E or it's a double E, I forget. But this means times 10 to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 to the ninth. Let's see what happens. All right, so it gave it to you in general form. But you can count up the number of zeros there and tack them on to the end. Sometimes if it's a really big number, a really small number, they'll give it to you in scientific notation. So for example, if I multiplied this by another thousand, let's see what happens. Yeah, so E, so 3.7 E9. So if you see an answer like this, it's in scientific notation. If the exponent is positive, like positive nine, you move the decimal point nine places to the right. And if the, if the um, exponent is negative, then you're going to move the decimal point to the left. So if we did uh, point um, zero, 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 
uh, five, six, nine, this one here. Well, in scientific notation, we want to put that decimal point between the five and the six. So to move it there, we would have to take that decimal point and move it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 places. So this would be 5.69 times 10 to the negative 12. And the calculator will display that in this way. It's just scientific notation. All right, and so when I hit enter, you'll see that it gives me the scientific notation in this format. So we use scientific notation to represent very, very small numbers like this one and very, very large numbers like this one. Because you can see it just won't fit on the calculator screen. Okay, there's one more that I wanna do before we uh, send you off into the groups. And this is one on acres. This is the one we want. Uh, Delta College sits uh, in, a, in a, it was built in a farm field, right? And it was a, uh, if you look at Mackinac and I forget all the rest of the roads, uh, Delta Road is one of them. And what's the other roads? There's some houses on some of them, but it's one square mile if you just add it up. And one square mile equals 640 acres. And with this conversion, you can actually, you know, calculate how many acres, you know, the home that you're in right now or a friend of yours or a relative if they own a piece of property that our house sits on there, you can actually measure the dimensions of the place and then figure out the number of acres. But here's the, here's the conversion in here. One square mile equals 640 acres. So as soon as you see this, um, this relationship, you can write your two fractions. Uh, when Delta College always, you know, puts out any literature about itself, it always reports the 640 acres instead of the one square mile, just because 640 is a larger number. And it makes Delta appear bigger than it is. You can also write 640 acres over one square mile. You want to choose the one, because each of those are equal to one. You can choose the one that will enable you to cancel out the 40 acres. So we start with 40 acres and just put it over one, because you know you're gonna do some canceling here. And then you wanna cancel out acres. And so you wanna select the one that has acres in the bottom. And that's this one here. So one square mile is equal to 640 acres. And that will then enable you to cancel out the acres. So multiply all the numbers in the numerators, multiply all the numbers in the denominators, and then divide, the only unit remaining is square miles. And let's see, four over 64 would be like 1 16th. And I believe that is 0 0.0625 square miles. So just a fraction of a, um, of a square mile is 40 acres. If you go on to, um, if you're looking to buy a piece of property or a house that sits on a piece of property, a lot of times they give you the, uh, the, the area of the lot so that you can compare it, see how, si how, how big it is. So if you had say 22,460 square feet, do you own more or less than an acre? If this is your house, your house sits on this property here that has this, these dimensions, do you own more or less than an acre? Well, since we asked the question, this is the one we're trying to figure out. This many square feet is equal to this many acres. And here you see this, one acre equals 43,560 square feet, 4,840 yards. So a lot of the conversions are here if you just if you just find them. And since we do have a relationship between square feet, 43,560 square feet is equal to one acre. Square feet cancels, and so we have 22,460 divided by 43,560, and the only unit remaining is the acre. So you can see that it's a fraction of an acre. It's not a whole acre. And to see specifically, I'll do the division and see 0.5156 acres. So what you can say is that you own about a half acre because that's close to 0.5. Just a little bit more than a just a little bit more than a half acre. All right. So you have uh, two and a half quarts is equal to how many pints? All right. So if you don't know the conversion, then you're going to have access to a sheet like this. And here it says that there are two pints in every quart. 
There are four quarts to a gallon, so that means there's eight pints to a gallon. But here's the one you want. Two pints PT is one quart QT. Write that over here. Two pints equals one quart. So we have 2.5 quarts, and I'm going to write it over one so I can cancel. Um, I know that these two are the same in quantity, so I can either write the fraction this way, or I can write the fraction this way. And I want the quart to be in the bottom so that I can cancel this quart on the top. So I'm going to use this one, and that's two pints is one quart, and then the quarts cancel. So the only thing left on the bottom is one, no units, and the unit left on the top is pints, and then you multiply two and a half times two and you get five, so five pints. What else? And if you compare these two, a million seconds is only 10.6 days, but a billion seconds, many of you are not even that old yet, 37 or 31.7 years. So from a million to a billion, quite substantially different. And here's ones where, you know, you can see you can cancel all these units. And sometimes you have to multiply all these units that you're familiar with in time and end up with, you know, the, the smallest unit that we normally work with seconds and then convert it to, to years. All right, in terms of the mathematics, you know, we're just multiplying by unit fractions and doing canceling. And so the, the trick is to find the, the correct unit fraction to convert. You do have a, a couple of arithmetic problems like this. I'm assuming you did all in that. <clears throat> all right, I'm going to add up, um, just write down all of these eight um, grocery bag weights, and I'm going to stack them so that the three that the pounds are in one column, and then the ounces are in another. So the first bag weighed three pounds, four ounces, and I'm just going to write the rest of them. Four pounds, two ounces, and 14, sorry, two pounds, 14 ounces, 14 there. And then one pound, eight ounces. And this one has no pounds and just 15 ounces. It must contain the chips or something. That bag, uh, four pounds, five ounces, three pounds, two ounces, and four pounds, one ounce. One ounce. No, that's 11 ounces. And then two pounds, 10 ounces, and that's it. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So those are all the weights. Now, if we just add up eight different bags, so the question is, can you carry them all in together in one trip? When you add up all these pounds, three plus two plus one, six plus four is 10, plus three is 13, plus four is 17, plus two is 19. You got 19 pounds total, but then you've got all these ounces. Four and 14, 18, plus eight, 26, plus 15, 41, plus five is 46, 47, 48, 58, 68. Did I do that right? I counted 59 before, so maybe a calculator would be good here. 26, 41, 46, 47, 48, 58, 68, 69. Okay, well, I was wrong in my calculation. 59. So that's 64 ounces plus 5 ounces. I think I left off that 1 there when I was adding it up. I said 1 ounce instead of 11, so I was 10 ounces short. All right, well, that's 4 pounds, and so... We're going to have four under the 19, 23 pounds, and five ounces. All right, let me finish it over here. All right, so um, 69, you want to like carry over. You want to figure out how many pounds are in in 69. And if you do, do just the multiples of 16, you have 16, and then 32, and then 48, and then 64, and then 80. Well, uh, one pound is 16, two pounds is 32 ounces, three pounds is 48 ounces, and four pounds is 64. So if you break down this 69, we have 64 ounces plus another five ounces. So we have 19 pounds plus, and if I break down the 69 ounces into 64 ounces and five ounces, these 64 ounces we can convert to pounds that's four pounds, and then we have the 19 pounds, and then I can combine the pounds together. So if you can carry 20, 23 pounds, five ounces, you can carry all the groceries in in one trip. In our conversions, we're going to be converting from using the same versions that you see there, and there'll be some tables. We're going to be converting from U.S. standard system to metric. I say American because Americans are one of the few that use 
the English Standard Units. So here are some conversions and here are the same kind of conversions. You'll see that they don't always match up perfectly, like depends on whether you want to round the conversion to one decimal place or three. But here are the conversions that you would use from one yard to, to meters, a yard to a meter. They're very close. And you have miles to kilometers, yards to meters the other way, feet to meters, and inches to meters. So they're 36 inches in a yard and 39.37 inches in a, in a meter. But anyways, here are the conversions from metric. So you'll see those. The um, Celsius temperature, centigrade, uh, that's the equivalent of the metric measure for, um, for temperature. I'll show you why here in a second. It has to do with um, the boiling point of water and the freezing point of water. Other units, you have units of capacity here where you're converting from milliliters to teaspoons. And then over here, you have the English standard units and over here, the metric units. And you have units of weight down here. Right about here is where it can starts from ounces to grams. So it can starts converting from, from English standard to the, to the metric. And this little T here, um, this is 0.9, um, little t is tons. We say it in the same way, but we pronounce, or we spell it T-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, and that there is a metric ton. And one metric ton equals 1,000 kilograms. Again, tons are a unit of, of um, weight in the metric system, and so we would expect there to be some kind of power of 10 there. Uh, the other thing that you should know is that um, we have cubic centimeters, and a centimeter is about the width of your finger. And so if you created a little box that was one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter so that it looked like this, and so you had a one centimeter cube, it's kind of like when, if you just chopped off your end of your finger, that would be like one centimeter cubed. That's about the size of it. Now, if you filled it up with some kind of liquid, like a medicine, and you filled up that little box, your little finger, we would call it cc's instead. Cubic centimeters, cubic centimeters. And if it is a liquid, then one cubic centimeter equals one milliliter. So that's how you would convert the metrics from capacity to volume. All right, there may be some others that we encounter along the way. 55 miles per hour, and you're wondering, well, I wonder what my speed is in kilometers per hour. The only difference is miles versus kilometers. The per hour piece is the same. So the conversion is 1.6, but so is the conversion up here. So if you just jump to the next number, 89, you would have a pretty good estimate of how fast you're going in kilometers per hour. Now you can actually do the conversion, 55 miles per hour. And then if you use that conversion, that one mile is equal to 1.6 kilometers. The miles unit cancels. You'd multiply 55 times 1.6. And my claim is that you're going to get something close to 89. The unit on top that remains is kilometers. The unit on the bottom that remains is hours. And so we would say 88 kilometers per hour. We do see over here, uh, if we just do the conversions in, in temperature, you see 100 Celsius corresponds to 212. So the Celsius scale was created so that the temperature at which it boils, they call that 100 degrees centigrade Celsius. Zero degrees is when water freezes. If you have some kind of liquid that's not water, like milk or orange juice, it's a little thicker than water. So it's going to take a, it's going to take a colder temperature to freeze it. Salt water takes longer to freeze than regular water. And then the point at which it boils. In Fahrenheit, it's 212. In Celsius, 100. You can see that there is no power of 10 for a normal body temperature. And I believe um, the, the 98.6 that they often cite as the normal body temperature for a human is really the body temperature for females. For males, it's a little colder than that, generally. Of course, everybody um, varies. But generally, it's close to that amount. OK, so here's uh, the two formulas that we're going to use. Um, generally, if you're going to estimate 
the Fahrenheit temperature that you're familiar with to Celsius. This um, nine fifths is 1.8 and it's very close to two. And so the way that you can figure out the Fahrenheit temperature if you have the Celsius temperature is multiply the Celsius temperature by 1.8. But a simpler number to multiply by is one close to that two. So we say double the Celsius temperature and then add 32. If you doubled the Celsius temperature and then added 32, you'd have a very good estimate of the Fahrenheit temperature. But this uh, converting from, from Celsius to Fahrenheit and vice versa, we're not gonna do this cancellation of units. What we're gonna do is use these equations and plug numbers in. So this is a little different. So let me take a, a look at some of these. Convert the given Fahrenheit temperature to its equivalent temperature on the Celsius scale. So you can see the two formulas. They are identical algebraically. If you want to convert the Fahrenheit temperature to Celsius, this is the one you'll use. And if you want to convert the <clears throat> Celsius temperature to Fahrenheit, this is the one you'll use. And so for this first set of problems, we're going to be using this, fun, uh, this formula here. So let's do number 59, 212. That's the boiling point of water. And so we're going to take C equals 5 ninths times the Fahrenheit temperature, which is 212, and then subtract 32. All right, you can punch this onto your, um, your, your calculator, or you can just multiply it out by hand. 212 minus 32 is 180. 180 cancels with a 9, leaving a 20. So you have 5 times 20, or 100 degrees Celsius. So the boiling point of water is 212 Fahrenheit, or which is equivalent to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, body temperature, if you take your temperature and all you have is a metric thermometer, and this will show you how to convert it. So you can see over here what they, what they claim that to be, but let's convert it. Celsius equals 5 ninths times the Fahrenheit temperature, 98.6 minus the, the 32. This one I'll do with the calculator. Just remember to, to put the, um, the 5 ninths as a fraction in parentheses. So 5 ninths times and then 98.6 minus 32. Here it says that 98.6 is about 37 degrees Celsius. And in fact, that's what it is, right on the nose. And there's some other ones there as well. All right, the one in the bottom, this is the one that we're going to use if we want to convert to Celsius to Fahrenheit from Celsius. So if we're given the Celsius scale, we can convert to Fahrenheit. And you could use this formula, but a simpler formula to use would be this one over here. So we're going to use, so we'll start with Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths. If you like 1.8 better, you can use 1.8. And so I'm going to do a negative one now, negative 25 degrees down here. Negative 25 is you know, maybe right here. So you can see it's also going to be negative over here. But Let's check it out. All right, so what we do is we take the Celsius temperature, which is negative 25, and then add 32. Again, you can use the calculator for this. Um, this one, I know that 5 cancels with 25, so I'm just going to do the cancellation. 9 times negative 5 is negative 45, plus 32, and that's negative 13. All right, so converting in temperature that's a little bit different than, than doing the unit analysis and doing the canceling. And the reason for that is there's no direct fraction that we can multiply by. There's a fraction, and then there's an add a little bit. Okay, so we're going to now convert from uh, some unit in the English standard system to some unit in the metric system. And we're going to start off with lengths, um, distances. And you can use either one of these. Some are rounded more than others. And here is a ruler that we typically see even on on my ruler here, you know, you've got inches and then you've got centimeters. So most of the time they come with, with both these days. But you can see just by looking at this right here, one inch equals about 2.54 or about two and a half centimeters. So if you brought down from one, one inch at the top and brought it right straight down, you would see, I'm going to get it straight here that you're going to have two and then this much. So this is a half, a half, one, 
one and a half, two, two and a half. So you can see just about two and a half inches is equal to one, or one inch is equal to two and a half centimeters there. So that's the conversion. It's a good one to know because with that one, you can convert any unit of length just by knowing this one here and knowing the relationship between the other units of measurement. So uh, there's usually more than one way to do these problems. So, um, you know, if you're going to do, if you're going to convert this problem in a way different than me, that's fine. But let's just take a look at uh, one of these. So 19 centimeters to inches, number 12. And another way to write the problem would be like this. So it's consistent with what we have been doing before. 19 centimeters is how many inches? And so we're just going to apply the same thing that we did before. The only difference is that these approximations are just that. They're not exact. So the best we can do is approximate these distances. 19 centimeters. And uh, again, I'm going to say, I'm going to write a fraction because one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. I'll write it. I'll write it like this. So here's what our authors call a unit fraction. But this allows us to cancel the centimeter unit. And then we write down everything that's left. Okay. 19 times 1 is 19. 1 times 2.4, 2.4. And the only unit remaining is inches. And then from here on out, put your calculator out and round to what they request, two decimal places, 19 divided by 2.54. And that's about 7.48. Okay, um, let's go from meters to yards. Now, for this one, um, I might use the same unit. And I want to show you two different ways, just so um, you know that answers might be a, a little different. So when they give you problems in Newton, make sure you use their conversion because their, conver their conversion is probably going to be consistent with their answers. But if we do number 15 here, we have 14 meters is equal to how many yards? Now, here's one way to do it. And I want to go back and well, I'll do it in two different ways. Uh, the first way is if I know the conversion exactly. And the second way is if I'm going to use one of these here. So I'm going to start off with the 14 meters, and then I'm going to cancel the meters. And one way that I can cancel the meters, and if I have this conversion in mind, I might say that one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. And then that would cancel out the meters, and so my unit would be centimeters. I want to convert to yards. So the next thing I'm going to do is to use this conversion up here, 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch. And then that would enable me to cancel out the centimeters. Uh, and finally, I do know the conversion between inches and yards. There are 36 inches and one yard. And that con unit conversion will enable me to cancel out the inches. So when I'm done, on the top, I have 14 times 100 times 1 times 1. And on the bottom, I have 2.54 times 36 times 1. And the only unit remaining is yards. So I'm going to get my calculator out and multiply the top two numbers and then divide by the bottom two numbers. And this is 15.31058618. Yards. And if we're rounding to two decimal places, I would say 15.31 yards. Now you can do the problem correctly yet still get a different um, estimate than this, but the estimate should be close. So now let me do this problem a different way. And let's see. Here we have a conversion from meters to yards. So I'm going to use this one now. So 14 meters, and we know that 0.9 meters is equal to one yard. Well, if we cancel out the meters, we're left with yards, and that's the unit we wanted to convert to. So I have 14 on the top, 0.9 on the bottom, and that's in yards. Do the conversion or the calculator. 
and we get 15.5555 yards. So if we use their conversion and we round to the two decimal places, it's going to be this and compare. If you're doing these questions on an exam, I would count both of those correct. Most, um, what I'm more interested in is the, the conversion and the work that you're showing as opposed to the final answer. All right, let's do one more. And that's this one here. Notice this one here is just slightly different conversion. One yard is 0.914 meters. So if I use that conversion, one yard equals 0.914 meters. Okay, the meters cancel, and I get 14 over 0.914. You can see if you compare these two, this one, this one to this one, we're just dividing by a slightly different number. And it's a number that's been rounded differently. So take 14 divided by 0.914, and you get 15.3172866. The more accuracy that you have in your um, conversion, the closer you're going to get. This one, if you rounded it, it's going to be 14.32 yards. All right, so I just wanted to alert you to this, that depending upon which conversion you use or conversions you use, you may get different answers rounded to the nearest hundredth of a percent. So use the conversions that are given in, in Newton, and I think it's this one here that they use. Okay, um, let me stop here and let you do one of these. Uh, why don't you go ahead and do number 14? Write your answer in the chat. 600 kilometers is equal to how many miles? I extend my Fibonacci sequence. It looks like 600 is here. And this is in kilometers, so if I wanted to convert to miles, I'd go back here. It's going to be a little bit less than 377, you know, maybe 370, 365, 375, something like that. So if you get something just close, but a little bit less than 377, that would be the, the correct answer. All right, so I see three different answers there, maybe four, four different answers. All right, so this could be because we have two different conversions. We've got miles to kilometers here. I'll write that one here. One mile equals 1.6 kilometers. And then we've got another one over here. 0.621 miles equals one. Kilometer. So let's see what we get using both, both methods. We have 600 kilometers and we want to convert to miles. So if we use this conversion here, we'll put 1.6 kilometers in the bottom is equal to one mile so that the kilometers cancel. This one over here, we need kilometers down in the bottom, just as we did here, but it's a new conversion. It's one kilometer equals 0.621 miles, and the kilometers cancel. So for this one, we would have to take the 600 and divide by 1.6, and we'd end up with miles. And this one, we'd have to take the 600 times 0.621, and that would give the number of miles. So let's see how close they are. In the first one, we have to take um, 600 and divide by 1.6. And some of you got 375, so that would be a good answer. And then maybe others use this one here and came up with 372.6. So there's another correct answer. And there's, a, there's some other answers in there that could also be equally correct. For example, 600 kilometers. Well, there, in one kilometer, there are how many centimeters? Many, many, many. All right, so let me just figure this out. There's a thousand meters and then there's another hundred. So it's a hundred thousand centimeters. I'm looking to apply this one right here. And then in 2.54 centimeters, that's one inch. Then there are 12 inches in one foot and there are 5,280 feet in one mile. So one, this equals one, this equals one, this equals one, this equals one. All of these equals one. So we're still left with 600 kilometers. But if you multiply all of these 
the centimeters cancel, the inches cancel, the feet cancel, the kilometers cancel, and the only unit left is miles. Now, this is clearly the hardest one, hardest one, right? Because you're multiplying by all these fractions. But what I'm saying is that you can even do it this way and you'll get something close to these numbers as well. So we have six zero zero and then another one, two, three, four, five zeros on the top. And on the bottom, we have to divide by 2.54, we have to divide by 12, and we have to divide by 5,280. And then the unit is miles. We're still going to have to get the calculator out on this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We want to divide by the 2.54, divide by the 12, and divide by the 5280. And there you see again. So this is the other answer that I saw in there. So this one also is correct. 372.82. All right, now sometimes we, um, we convert, we use a couple of um, units and we have to convert both of them. And a lot of times it works with these rates like convert miles per hour to kilometers per hour, something like this. And all right, so this is just, I might try a different one. I don't like these problems, but what if we did this? The way, the, the way that they measure uh, bullets coming out of guns typically is in feet per second. So they don't talk about a bullet traveling at, you know, 700 miles an hour. Uh, they rather talk about projectiles as in feet per second. So here's a problem that we can try. Convert uh, 120 miles per hour to so many feet per second, feet per second. These are some common units that you'll see in a science course of some some sort. The best way to convert this is to think about this as miles as the top unit and hours as the bottom unit. So if you drove 120 miles to Detroit and you were averaging uh, and it took you two hours, then 120 divided by two is 60. And then you would have the miles as the top unit and hours as the bottom unit. But the way that we just typically write that is miles per hour. So the division sign is the per. Now, if you want to convert to uh, feet per second, you have to convert the miles unit to feet. So you'd say, well, in one mile, there are 5,280 feet. And then you can cancel out the miles and you're left with feet, and that's what you want, feet. The other unit that you want is a unit of time. You want the unit second in the denominator. Right now, the unit hours is in the denominator. So we need to convert hours to second. And we need to cancel the hours unit. So one hour is 60 minutes. I know that one. That will cancel the hours unit. That's going to leave us with minutes in the denominator. Well, we want seconds in the denominator. So I know the conversion between minutes and seconds. There are 60 seconds in one minute. I'll put the, the end there. So now the minutes unit cancels. The only unit left in the top is feet. And the only unit that has not been canceled in the bottom is seconds. So our answer is going to be in feet per second. All right, so we have to multiply in the top 120. 5,280, and then a 1 and a 1, which doesn't change anything in the bottom. We have to divide by 60 and then divide by another 60. So multiply the top numbers and divide by both of the bottom numbers. So something traveling 100 miles per hour is also traveling 176 feet per second. All right, so the mathematics involved in all of these problems is very much um, the same. You're going to pick out one of the, the unit conversions and multiply it by what's given to try to convert it to what's not given. So let's go on to capacity, unnecessary round answers to two decimal places. Okay, so um, we have these little devices. Uh, if you have children, um, there's this, looks like a little cylinder, it's a little plastic and it has the measurements on it. And it includes both milliliters and, and teaspoons. And sometimes when you give medicine to an infant, they ask you to give either milliliters or teaspoons. 
And so it's important when you're administering medicine to children that you get it right. And I've seen doctors that I've attended with my own children who actually get a piece of paper and pencil out and they actually do the conversion um, to convert. So what if you only have teaspoons and you have something that measures teaspoons and the dose is 22 milliliters. Now that's a lot of medicine, right? 22 milliliters. But let's, let's see how many teaspoons that would be. And the abbreviation that we use for teaspoon is little t. And the abbreviation that we use for tablespoon is capital T. So we want to convert 22 milliliters. So as before, we're going to look for a conversion that converts from milliliters to teaspoons. And there you see it, the very first one. One teaspoon is equal to five milliliters. And we're going to use this conversion. We're going to write it as a fraction so that we can cancel out the unit we don't want. And the unit that we do want remains. So take all the top numbers, multiply them together. Take all the bottom numbers, multiply them all together. And then write the unit. The decimal is better in this case. So it looks like 4.4. Teaspoons. Here's another abbreviation of the uh, tablespoon. Teaspoon little t, tablespoon capital T. All right, why don't you try number um, 33? Put your answer in the chat. Okay, so everybody's, uh, most everyone, so there's one answer. So there could be other ways that you could, you could use this, but um, you're going to see uh, these conversions also. So you could convert from cups to fluid ounces and so on and multiply a couple of other numbers. The quickest way to this would be to, to use the conversions from liters to quarts, this one right here. So eight liters, and then we have one quart equals 0.95 liters, and then the liters cancel, and so we have eight divided by 0.95. And so I guess that number that you've reported there is rounded. Okay, very good. All right, let's take a look at an application. Um, take a look at number 29. A swimming pool has a volume of 33,600 cubic feet. Given that one cubic foot has a capacity of 7.48 gallons, how many gallons of water does the pool hold? So maybe there are these trucks that deliver water to your pool and they come in a thousand gallon containers and you want to know how many trucks you have to order pay for to fill your pool. Now cube, cubic is the third power. And so when it says cubic feet, you know, just imagine something that's one foot by one foot by one foot. And it doesn't quite look that way in my picture, but one foot by one foot by one foot. There's 33,600 of those that you can fit in a pool. And the problem is to convert that to the number of gallons of water. So if you filled this box up with water, it would take a couple of gallons and it tells you seven gallons in a cubic foot. So one cubic foot has a capacity of 7.48 gallons. So one cubic foot is equal to 7.48 gallons. That is, you can put seven point seven about seven and a half gallons inside this little box here. Seven and a half gallons of water would fill up the one by one by one box. So here's a conversion that you can multiply by or you can flip it around and use this one. Use the one that would enable you to can cancel out the cubic, the cubic foot. All right, so we're gonna start with 33,600 cubic feet. And then we're gonna multiply that by this one because this version of it has cubic feet in the denominator. And the cubic feet will cancel, leaving the unit that we want, gallons, figure that out, we multiply on the calculator. So we've got to multiply these two numbers and there's only ones in the bottom. So that's 25, so 251,000 gallons. So if a truck only holds 1,000 gallons, then you're going to have to have 251 loads coming your way. So those trucks must hold a lot, a lot more than 1,000 gallons. Okay. Um, I'd like you to do number 30, and I'll give you a hint as to where you find it. So do number 30, and then here is the unit that I will give you. So this one will help you convert. It says an aquarium has a volume of 76,000 76, cubic centimeters. 
And so you've got this one liter bottle and you want to know how many times you have to fill it up and dump into that aquarium to fill up the aquarium. So how many liters of water does the aquarium hold? So this unit right here is the cubic centimeter and go ahead and put your um, answer in the chat. If you frame this question kind of like our other ones, 76,000 cubic centimeters, we also abbreviate that CCs, cubic centimeters is equal to how many liters? So milliliters is kind of a, a liquidy thing, it kind of takes a bunch of different shapes, could be in a cone or a box. We typically don't think about putting liquid in a box, but um, if you had a one by one by one centimeter box and fill it up with liquid, the liquid inside would have a capacity of one milliliter. Okay, it looks like we've got some 76s in there. All right, <clears throat> so one cc is equal to one milliliter. That's what this says. And that will enable us to cancel that cc unit. So we're left with milliliters. And then milliliters and liters are both metric measurements. There are 1000 milliliters in a liter. And here's what the liter metric scale would look like. And you can see going from milliliters to liters, you have to make three jumps of 10, 10 times 10 times 10, 10 is 1,000. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say there's 1,000 milliliters in one liter. All right, then the milliliter unit cancels and then the unit that you want remains the liters. So you have to take 76,000 and divide by 1,000 and yes, 76 liters on that one. Okay, and then weight or mass, something else, you know, we got liquid and fluid ounces and that kind of thing. And, and now we have weights. In the English standard system, we use ounces and pounds and tons. And in the metric system, we use grams or some version of that. Milligrams, kilograms. And if you have a thousand kilograms, you have a metric ton. So some of these conversions here also appear up here, these three. So these are the three basic ones that are also up here. But here are some other ones as well that from the English standard system that you might be familiar with. One pound is 16 ounces and one ton is 2000 pounds. So let me take a look at, um, oh, I don't know, number 27. We have 540 kilograms and we wanna know how many pounds that is. All right, so go ahead and do this one and then put your own weight in there and find out how much you weigh in kilograms, right? So you probably know how much you weigh, my weight in pounds equals how many kilograms. So if you wanna know how much you weigh in kilograms, put your weight here and then convert it to kilograms. We're actually doing the opposite. We're starting with kilograms and converting to pounds. And here's the unit we're gonna use. One pound is 0.45 kilograms. Uh, a lot of times we'll also see that uh, the other way. So sometimes you'll see there's 2.2 kilograms in every pound, right? So using this relationship, and notice it's got approximately equal to because they did round this number. We can write it as a unit fraction with kilograms in the bottom so that it cancels the kilograms in the top there. And so then 540, divided by 0.45, and then the unit would be pounds, or 1,200. So people in other countries are worried about their weight as well. And, but when they report their weight, they're gonna say, well, I only weigh like, you know, 50, or I only weigh 75. And their unit is kilograms. Each kilogram, no, each kilogram is 2.2 pounds. All right, now, um, over in other countries, they measure their heights in meters. So it's not uncommon for them to, when asked how tall they are, they'll say something like, you know, 1.7. How tall is someone who's 1.7? The implied unit there is meters. So correct to the nearest foot and inch. How tall is this person? How many feet, how many inches? So this way you'll have both your weight in kilograms and uh, you can see how to convert your, your height as well. So this is when we're going back, right? So here's the conversion to yards from meters to yards. So you can use that one. 
0.914 and one yard has three feet. All right, so 1.7 meters, we know that 0.914 meters is equal to one yard. And we know that one yard is equal to three feet. So this would enable us to cancel out the meters unit and the yards unit. So we have to take 1.7 and multiply that by three on the top. And on the bottom, we have just 0.914. And this is in feet. OK, so I asked for this one in inches. And so we're now going to convert to inches. We know we have five whole feet. And then we have this fraction of one foot. I'm just going to call it 0.58. It's close enough, 0.58 feet. So we have to convert 0.58 feet to inches. So we know that there are 12 inches in one foot. So we have five feet and then the feet will cancel here. So we have 0.58 times 12, 6.96 inches. So we're going to call it five feet, seven inches tall. So someone who says that they're 1.7 meters, that works out to five feet, seven inches. All right, now the rest of these on the last page of the notes for today, they are all application. So let's take a look at a couple of these. At some point in these problems, you're going to you're going to have to use some kind of unit analysis to convert from one unit to the next. In answering these problems, we're going to do this cancellation and the unit that we write down might look strange to you, but I'll, it's not the standard measurement units that we use, but it can still that this whole process of unit analysis where we're converting and canceling fractions can be used in in any application problem. So let's take a look. 67. Six items purchased at a grocery store weigh 14 kilograms. One of the items is a detergent weighing 720 grams. What is the total weight in kilograms of the other five items? Okay, total weight minus the detergent weight. This is one item, this is six items. And so <clears throat> the weight of the other five, five items. So this one, all it involves is a subtraction. You've got the total weight of the six items, but then you take out the detergent's weight, and then that would leave you with the weight of the other five items. So the weight, total weight, and this would fall under the heading of, you know, doing arithmetic, right? Arithmetic with these units. And if you've done the problems in Newton, 4.5.1 through 4.5.4, you're going to see some problems like this. 14 kilograms minus... 720 grams equals what we're looking for. And in order to, it wants your answer in kilograms. So in order to write the answer in kilograms, we have to convert both of these units to kilograms. Well, this one's already in kilograms, 14 kilograms, but the 720 is not. So we first have to convert the 720 grams into kilograms and then we'll do the subtraction. So 720 grams, right? grams is right in the middle, kilograms to the left, milligrams to the right. We're converting to kilograms. So there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. So we're doing a unit analysis on just part of the problem. So when you cancel the grams, you have 720 on top and 1,000 on the bottom. And if you do that division, you get 0.720, or just 0.72. Now that these have the same units, we can subtract them. And that would be uh, 13 point. All right, go ahead and try number 68. It's about nickels. And so here's how you can you know, break down the problem to make it look like the ones that we've done before. You know, we don't have units of you know, standard measurement units here, but they are telling us that one nickel weighs five grams. So with that information, you can say how many nickels equals four kilograms. Okay, Tasha, I see your answer to the previous one. Go ahead and uh, put your answer uh, to number 68 in the chat as well. I just need to see how many of you are still hanging on here. Yeah, uh, four kilograms, uh, each kilogram is about 2.2 .2 pounds. And so this bag of nickels that we have is gonna weigh about 8.8 .8 pounds. So it's going to be a lot of nickels. Okay, so we have two answers of uh, 800. So thank you, Anna. Chris, take a look. Four kilograms. Uh, we do see grams here. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to convert from kilograms to, gram, to grams. And there are 1,000 grams in each kilogram. So this is one. 
but it enables us to cancel the kilograms. And then we want nickels. And so here's our conversion between nickels and grams. We want the grams piece down in the bottom so that we can cancel grams with grams. So five grams is equal to one nickel. So we can even write a unit fraction with something other than our standard measurement, um, English standard measurements or the, or the metric measurements. We can even use nickel as a unit of measurement. So the grams are going to cancel. So the only unit remaining is nickels. And so you've got four times a thousand on the top and five on the bottom. So I concur that there must be 800 nickels. Okay, for those of you in the, um, the medical field, take a look at, um, again, I'll, I'll try one of these and then, and then you can maybe do the other one. Uh, I'll do maybe number 72, see it here. Ask you to determine the drug dosage, okay? This is serious because you're gonna give a drug to somebody, maybe a child, maybe someone in your family. And the only clue that they gave you is that um, one pound is equal to 0.45 kilograms. We've seen that one before. The prescribed dosage of a drug is 10 milligrams per kilogram daily, meaning that 10 milligrams of a drug should be administered daily for each kilogram of a patient's weight. How many 400 milligram tablets should be given each day to a patient who weighs 175 pounds? Okay, so I'm going to go in here and kind of read this with you. It says 10 milligrams should of the drug should be administered each day. So we're talking about a daily dose. And then they ask us down here, you know, how many pills should be given each day. So we do have another unit that they've given us in here. And that's that we need to give 10 milligrams of the drug to one kilogram of a person's weight. Now, this is going to be a unit fraction for us. We know that this is milligrams of a drug, and we do know this is kilograms of a, of a person's weight. So we'll keep the, the unit there because we're dealing in the same metric units there. So milligrams per kilogram daily. Okay, so then here comes the question. How many 400 milligram tablets should be given each day to a patient who weighs? All right, so we start with 175 pounds, and we want to convert that to the number of 400 milligram tablets. So here's how you can work through this one. So we first, you know, we got to use this one and we got to convert to pounds because that's what is given. So our first step is to convert from pounds to kilograms. And after we get kilograms, then we'll say, well, for each kilogram, there has to be 10 milligrams of the drug. And then we'll work into this 400. All right, so we're going to multiply. Uh, one pound in the bottom, using this unit conversion here, is equal to 0.45 kilograms. This would enable the pounds unit to go away and leaving us with the number of kilograms. So we need to multiply 40, uh, 0.45 times 175, and that's 78.75. All right, so this person weighs 78.75 kilograms. Next part. For someone that weighs this much, we have to administer 10 milligrams of the drug for every kilogram the person weighs. And this is person's weight. So we're going to multiply by the 10 milligrams of the drug all over one kilogram of the person's weight. So the kilograms of the person's weight will cancel, leaving the number of milligrams of the drug. And everything in the bottom cancels out. If you take 10 and multiply by this number, you get 787.5 milligrams of the drug, right? And then the next step, you could probably just look at what they have here and say, identify the number of tablets, right? But if you really want to take this to one more step, you would say 787.5 milligrams, and there are 400 milligrams in one tablet here. So if you then cross out the milligrams, you're left with the number of tablets to administer. And so you need to take the 787.5 number and divide by the 400, and it's 1.96875. So about two tablets. You're actually giving them more than what is recommended, but it's an insignificant amount more if you give two tablets. You certainly wouldn't want to start chopping up the tablets to try to 
match this perfectly.